Hey, uh, David, good evening. It is a, uh, what is a Monday evening in beautiful California? Yes, we are pre-recording for CRX, and I think we got all the Zoom issues worked out, because as you know, Zoom just works. Oh my goodness, that just works has been the quite the adventure, but I'm glad that we are where we are now. So uh, today we've got a treat especial. Um, as part of your uh, your uh, popular series of 64 seconds, you found another great gem uh, to go through, and it's the game Pirates. Tell us a little bit about this game. So the game is Piracy. Um, it's an Australian game from 1985. I had not really played it until recently. And uh, you know how you have totally different ways of having fun with 8-Bit than I do? I mean, yes. you repair Commodores and you do things that people find useful. I like to do useless things. <clears throat> and one of the things I like doing is watching uh, old 8-bit um, game AIs lose to modern computers. So I've done a couple of YouTube videos like this, watching 8-bit chess lose, 8-bit Othello lose, 8-bit Go lose. I did a, I'm trying to remember, the the 7-Up Spot game. I had that one lose as well. Um, so what I did is I made... Um, this video that you see over here, because I, I was playing Piracy, and its AI is pretty good. It was beating me, and I didn't like that. So I wrote a Python script to beat the Piracy um, AI, and I have a video of that here, which I'm going to start. But I thought it made a really good concrete example to work from so that you and I could just talk about what was 8-bit uh, video game AI in general like? How did the ancient ones pull that off? So, so and, be, and before, and I think I think this is going to be really cool for those people that haven't seen the sixty-four second uh, video yet, where you kind of explain the game piracy. Um, tell us a little bit what the object of the game is before we even start. For those people okay. that haven't, I, seen I will that. explain the rules. Um, by the way, Yuri watched that, and Yuri here, and got back to me saying that you talk a little bit too fast. So at any point. You could pretend like there's a speed knob and just just do this to me. Give me that oh, hand signal. And, I, nice. and oh yeah, <clears throat> you, you have the power here. So okay. Uh this pie, you can't see my mouse, so I'm just gonna use words. So what you see on here is you have two pirate captains and they each have their own boat. And there are five squares that you see on each one of these boats. Those are cannon holds. You got a cannon in there, those little flaps can open, and that gives you access to the cannons. But the cannons do not launch cannonballs, they launch pirates. So behind every one of these cannons is three pirates. So they look like little weird green faces behind each one on the left and yellow faces on the right. Um, and I'm going to advance this video a little bit um, uh, manually here. This is a point in which a green pirate was launched in the top left-hand corner, and you can see now there's a pirate missing behind that cannon hold because one of the three pirates is out. And the same thing in the bottom right. Um, and what you do on each turn is you either launch pirates from cannons, and you can launch anywhere from one to five cannons. We'll launch one pirate each. Or you can move the pirates across the rope. So let me zoom forward a little bit to, yeah, this is a, a later part where um, in this circumstance, that green pirate uh, on the left is moving towards the opponent. You always move across towards the opponent's boat. So you can go straight across, in which case if that green pirate went straight across, he would kill that purple pirate and take its I... place. Um, or he could go diagonally up, in which case he's ran out of net and he screen wraps to the bottom on the other side. Oh. Or he could go diagonally down, and you can see there's broken chain there or rope. And when he hits the broken rope, he'll fall into the ocean, he lose the pirate. Um, when you move the pirates, all the pirates on the rope have to move completely together. So if the purple side was moving straight across, it would kill that green pirate. But that one by the broken rope would move into there and it would die. So it would it would take a pirate, but it would lose a pirate. Right. So the only other thing to consider is what happens when you're at the very edge. So if I, let me see if I can move this forward to where a pirate gets close to the edge. Let's see. Um, well, just imagine if if I'm um, right at the cabin hold of the other pirate boat and I go into it, I can kill all the pirates that are there. And I do something called blowing that hatch. Um, and then I can wrap back around to my side and come out of my cannon again if my hatch is not blown. 
And if there's a spot for me left, if there's three pirates, there's no spots for me. But if there's fewer than three pirates, I can come back. Those are all the rules of the game. I know I said it quickly. Um, I, I say, but, but this is, a, well, it's already a lot more elaborate than it was on the 64 <laughs> second uh, video. Now, what's the end objective? The end objective of so the, the end objective is to, is to um, eliminate all the opponent's pirates. If you do that, you win. Um, the documentation will actually say if you blow all the hatches, but it's not true. If you play a two-player game and blow all the hatches, the game doesn't end. So okay. you have to actually kill off all the pirates. But the, the AI is going to look ahead on the Commodore a little bit. And if it sees unavoidable death in its future... Uh, its pirate captain will just walk the plank and uh, okay. give up. And we're going to see that in the example here. Okay. Um, now, so a, little bit, so a little bit about the game then. You said you hadn't played the game when you were young. No, so this no. is a new game to you. Brand new game. That's fun. It's it's a little gem I hadn't discovered yet. How, how um, did, so how did you find out about this game? I don't remember. All I know is it's made of unobtainium. Um, it, people have been searching for this for a long time. It comes in this little clamshell thing. It was at a very limited distribution in Australia, is my is my understanding. Um, and I think the next time I see it on eBay, it's going to be very expensive. It doesn't show up very often at all. So when you when you got this game, yeah, I presume the, because it's what, a style. What what is easier to find though is the board game adaptation. Which is exactly the same oh. game. So, if you so like... there was an actual board game adaptation post the digital version of this game. Yeah, see that? Um, that is awesome. Based on the Commodore 1985 yeah, game. Yeah, that came out in 2006. That very, very cool. That's yeah. very, very cool. That you can actually now, find. Now, so when you when you got this when you got this game, obviously at that moment in time. Uh, because it's a style of game that you like. You uh, you collect these type of uh, gems. It's an abstract uh, strategy. You tried, you, you tried playing this. How did that go? How did you fare playing so, this? So uh, the AI in this game was beating me badly. <laughs> and that's why I had to write this Python script. I think now that I've actually gone through the exercise of watching the AI play the game, I have a, um, I have a lot better grasp of it. I don't know. It just didn't feel intuitive. I like it. I respect the game. I was immediately bad at it. Um, which led me to write the Python script. So, so, and 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 I want to zoom in a little bit more on that because that's obviously interesting. Eh? So, uh, I suck at playing games. I remember when I was young, the reason for me to start coding was actually to start writing trainers, because yeah, I I wanted to make sure that I could somehow figure out how to get to the end of the game. In this case, obviously, this is uh, this is a lot more complex to get to. So, at what moment in time did you? What steps did you go to before you decided, let me try and write a piece of AI to try and beat this game? Well, it was hard enough to figure out how to <laughs> play it. Um, I, I know the rules are rather simple, but I was frustrated for a long time. You would go into demo mode, and I couldn't even figure out how to get out of demo mode. I, I put in device, and I was looking at the um, the CI registers. as like, what keys is it checking for? It's like, it's not checking for any keys. It's like, there's no way to escape this. Not realizing the restore key is going to trigger the, the non-maskable interrupt, and that's what it was trapping to go back in. So I was off to a slow start, but... Um, it has four skill levels, as you can see on the on the picture that I have on there. Uh, nobody I, I was reading online, everybody respects this game and likes this game online, It's it, but not a lot of people know about it. Nobody's beaten it on level four that I saw. Uh, everybody's like, that's, you know, you can't beat it, which is what kind of gave me the idea for the challenge. Um, and I didn't want to try to integrate the Python with the, the Commodore itself. If you look on the left-hand side there, and you just see the, you know, the green text, that's Python's view of the world. And so when it tells me to do a move, I take a joystick and I enter it in the Commodore. And when the Commodore moves, I put the move back into the Python. It's just it's just for fun. Uh, I didn't put a ton of work into it. It came together pretty quickly. Um, I have it out, by the way, on GitHub. I'll put a link in the CRX forums for anybody who wants to go and improve on the AI because there's lots of room for improvement. I stopped as soon as it was beating the Commodore. So there's there's a ton more stuff you can do with it. Supposedly, someone is making a cell phone based version of this game late this year. I don't have any more details on that. I just saw those hints dropped on um, Lemon. I think that's something I will definitely buy because this sounds like something. This sounds like a fun airplane game for that's, me to do. And then then I'm gonna want to see how that how they did their AI as well, how it compares to my Python script. And then maybe I'll go back and make the Python script better. There's lots of options to do that, which I'll be talking about. So um, so okay so so let's let's try and let's try at the start did you so you played the game did you beat it at all at any level 
Well, yeah, like at, at level one, ultimately, at I, level I was one. Being, yeah, this is a this is embarrassing. I'm not particularly good at it. I'm 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 getting better. Um, but yeah. for for me, the fun was in making the AI, just like for you, the fun was making the trainers. Sure, sure, so I get that. It's so, the game so outside tell us the game. A little bit on how how do you go about how do you go about where a game like this, where you know, in 64k, someone has written something that is clearly hard to beat um, by by mere humans. How do you go about figuring out a way to kind of cheat that with uh, without changing the code? Okay, so let's dive into what you do when you want to make an 8-bit AI. First, though, I want to look at the board representation I have here, at least on my left, um, that green text. You can see that the initial board shows a bunch of threes on the left and a bunch of negative threes on the right. This is a common thing to do in very simple representations. You'll make one player positive numbers and you'll make one player negative numbers. You can do this with chess pieces or things like this. Um, and so the threes are the three pirates that are behind the cannons, both the yeah. positive ones, which are green, the negative ones, which are the yellows. Um, the X's are the holes in the ropes. And later on, when, it, when, when one of the cannon holes gets blown, that will be an X as well. So the Python starts with its first move. Um, it said cannon launch 00001, which means I'm launched. I'm that's just a binary number that that I made for a nice compact way of, of saying anywhere from one to five cannons. So that's starting from the bottom, 00001. So the topmost cannon is what Python wants to launch. And you can see it right there. The the pirates in reserve went down to two, that spot became one. And that's yeah. the first move it wants me to do. It's currently looking a look ahead of six moves ahead, which I'll just explain in a second. And to do that, it had to consider 18,396 positions because of some optimizations it did. Otherwise, it would be a much larger number. And I'll go into how that works. So okay. 118,000, I, I think I see. 118,000, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> if you want to make uh, an AI for, um, if you're in the early 80s and you have a turn-based game, um, you generally use something called a mini max tree. And there's three things you have to build. And this is where you can turn that knob on me if I start to go too fast at any time, just put your hand up. Um, you have three things you have to build. You have to have a static evaluation function, um, which is just basically looking at the board at in an instant without thinking ahead or anything and say, say, how favorable is this to the player you're trying to maximize its value? That's your, in this case, the Python player. I want the Python player to win, not the Commodore player. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the Python is going to be on the left, the, the green characters. Um, so it's just how good it is at the time. And the, and the most simple way to do it is just to assign the pieces values. Like if it's chess, a queen is worth a lot more than a pawn, whatever. Right. But then you just add up all those values and you subtract the opponent's values. And that's a very simple static evaluation function. And that's all I did for this game. My static evaluation function is dumb. Normally, you want to look at um, the board and what a good position on the board is like for chess. If you had a piece that um, is going to move, but it's going to kill a line of attack that you've set up, you don't want to. You don't want to. Um, that that takes away from the value of the board. Or being in the center, you know, could be good. Or having a, a your king, um, having the opponent's king pushed towards a, a corner, that could be a good position as well. So, <clears throat> the second thing you need is a move generator. So from any given position, like this starting position you see right there, initial board, you have to be able to say, okay, I want to consider some set of moves. Now, piracy is so constrained that you can consider all the moves. And I think the Commodore does this too. Um, with chess, it's too many moves and you just have to say, um, we have some heuristics that show these are the ones we want to look at. But with this game, we can look at all of them because with five cannons, that's um, uh, up to 31 different kinds of opening moves you can do. Yeah, and then yeah. as you're moving across the board, you're either going that way, that way, or that way. So that's three more moves. So that's that's not a whole lot. So from every position, you can have, you know, uh, 34 more different kinds of yeah. moves to consider yeah. underneath. Um, and after that, when you have those two pieces, the last piece you need is a look-ahead tree, which we're calling a mini-max tree. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. From a starting position, I can see all of the moves that I, I Python right, right can do and i want to maximize my goodness i i have some score for these i can statically evaluate right yep. if this is my yep. trees only this far and if i'm looking one move ahead that's called one ply ply um 
And so I want to maximize all of that. But for each one of these individual moves, you can build yet another tree under it of what the opponent's responses yeah. would be. And that opponent is working against you. The Commodore does not want Python to win. So each one of those, the, the Commodore is, you can assume it's going to minimize the value on that. And then for right. each one of those moves, Python gets to play and Python wants to maximize its value. So you have this min, max, min, max, min, max, all the way down this tree. And what that lets you do is at the very bottom of these leaves, you evaluate what the board looks like. And then these evaluations trickle up these branches and they start to join and you take the minimum value, the maximum value until it gets all the way up to the top. And then you have a good idea of which way you're supposed to go. And this algorithm goes way back. Um, Von Neumann, uh, mm -hmm. if you've heard of him, wrote this up in the 1920s um, on paper, of course. There was no computer yeah. to type this on. Um, a guy named Claude Shannon in the 1940s then um, developed this further, saying here's how you would uh, have uh, computers that would play chess. He came up with the static evaluation functions, like everything I just described. He had no computer to play it on. But all that stuff you know, played out marvelously uh, once a few more years happened. So um, the thing you'll probably um, go ahead and interject at any point if you want to. The, this tree is getting really wide, though, because it's growing sure. exponentially. Yeah. And yeah. Um, if you look at the math over there, when that says look ahead of six, that should be a much larger number than 118,000 positions considered, um, right. game boards considered. So that's way too big for a Commodore 64. What you need is some intelligent pruning on that tree so that you don't have to search um, all of that space. Yeah. So this pruning is called alpha beta pruning. And this was developed in the 1950s. And the intuition for this is pretty simple. If, you, if you're looking down the tree and something bad happens for you, and it's unacceptably bad, then there's no point in exploring fully and exploring that, that tree to see how bad is yeah. it really, right? Yeah. You don't care. You just chop right. it off and you keep moving when you're doing your search. So right. um, more formally, if you, well, not really formally, but if if I have a position up here and I have a maximizing level, and let's say I have a 10 here and this branch has been fully explored. Now I'm starting to explore a new branch. And now I come down to the minimizing level and there's an eight. Well, this eight at this minimizing level means nothing's going to bubble up that's any higher than eight. It is going to be right. eight or lower. So if you right. bubble up that eight, that eight is always going to be less than this 10 year maximizing yeah, level. So this yeah. value is independent of anything you will discover in this tree. So you, tr you trim it. And the way this happens is that you are um, maintaining two values. One's called alpha, one's called beta, right? It's the alpha beta pruning. The Alpha is that minimum score you're guaranteed of if you're Python, and the beta is that maximum score you're guaranteed of if you're a Commodore 64, because we're always trying to maximize the Python. That's right. how it works. And you maintain these things, and you triple them down, and you just trim all over the place, and it really makes a difference. Uh, all the ancient ones use this technique, um, and it's it's not that hard. Um, I made a bug in it. I found the bug. It's, it's annoying to test, but um, it was probably harder for the... 6502 coders to find that. So um, when it works best is when you are able to see your best scenario right off the bat, because then you have all these comparators and you can prune like mad. So I actually choose intentionally the order of possible moves that I evaluate to try to predispose it to certain kinds of things I wanted to look at first, like sure. horizontal. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm here and the enemy's here and we have one rope column in the middle, if I move, then I get killed. If he moves, then yeah. he gets killed. Whoever moves next gets killed. So yeah. the answer is to stall by launching someone from a cannon. So you you want to be able to stall. I've even seen the computer plop, shoot out a uh, pirate and put it over itself and kill its own pirate in order to stall because stalling was so important to it. That right, 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 right. Happen. So, yeah. um, so I favor those things so they come out first. So the, it looks a little bit smarter because remember my static evaluation function is really dumb. Right. So um, it, it doesn't look at... Um, heuristics at all. Um, I think the Commodore, I need to do more testing, but I think the Commodore static valuation function is better than mine because when I made the plies kind of similar, it was starting to gain a little bit of a lead. If you look over there, it says board evaluation zero. That means yeah. that everybody's even. Uh, so when you see small, if that became like the number two, that means it thinks it's two pirates, uh, two points ahead, basically. Um, yeah. And yeah. I was starting to lose in the middle of the game when I didn't have the ply hard enough. So 
So it's really dumb, but I look way into the future using all kinds of extra memory and resources and wasteful yeah. programming. Because Hello. I mean, my 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 laptop is sitting on a throne of Moore's law, right? It's 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 not going to it's, it's 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 not a comparison that's even yeah. funny. And, I mean I, I don't have to be efficient. I could copy this board in memory a ton of times. I could just throw resources. It's just a yeah. Python script, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now the so, but what is interesting? What is interesting in this, uh, and and I think you just gave the answer. But so far, you have not looked at the code of the game. So when no. you speak about these optimizations that they have done in the game, that you presume are there. You've actually not looked at that, eh? I'm, I'm like, so I, I have not done any reversing on the game, but I've done some experiments. I know when it's at level four, it is looking for ply. And I'm going to show you this with a video. I should have started the video earlier. Um, I'm starting it now, and some of the gameplay is going to play out here. So, and, um, and, and a couple of things on this. Eh? So you're running you're running the game in Vice, and the reason why you're running it in Vice, not just the video capture, it is horrendously slow. Eh? Yes, at level four, it can take about a minute for the computer to move. Um, so it will, um, it's, oh, I have discord on. That's why I keep hearing those chimes. Never mind. We'll fix it in post, but, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, on level four. I don't want to waste that much time. So I have it on four speed emulation, uh, right here because that's how much faster my laptop made it. Um, but I do know that it sees four moves ahead because there's going to become a point in this video where. You can see right there, I'm increasing the Python look ahead to seven. See how I typed in ply seven over yeah. there? Um, as you continue to play the game, the search space goes down because there's fewer things it has to consider because the board is becoming simpler as more pirates are on the board and you don't want to make yeah. bad moves and more pirates are getting killed. So the search space goes down and down and down. And as it does, I tell the ply to go up. And then yeah. it's... Um, it, it well, you're that. about... Uh, what, how many, I, I saw just almost a million positions being evaluated just a moment ago, right? Well, yeah, you're so over a million right now. That's because I increased the ply to seven. But pretty soon that number is going to go down. I'm going to increase the ply manually again. Now, the, the ancient ones did a better job. Uh, they would automatically increase the ply uh, when they saw they weren't seeing um, as many things being considered. Um, right. And I could have done that in the code. But again, I stopped once I was beating the uh, Commodore. When I keep saying ancient ones, I want to show you a concrete example. This is um, video chess. Did you yeah, for the that? Atari, is that the Atari 2600? What is yeah, that? Yeah, so this is a 6502 code, right? Uh, but this is in, in the late 1970s. And uh, this game uh, is only 4K. And remember, the Atari only has 128 bytes of RAM. So just right, right, right. to address the 64 uh, squares on the chessboard, uh, that's 64 bytes right there. Now, they can they can use reuse some of those bytes upper nibbles, you know, for things and stuff. But, I mean, everything got reused. Um, and like my Python, this is doing mini max. This is doing alpha beta pruning, uh, but it's way smarter because, um, like I said, one of the reasons is it automatically increases this ply as it has, yeah, you know, yeah, as yeah. the game goes along. It also cares about board position quite a bit and has a lot of rules for that. But right. it also does um, something called the quiescence switching. So, one of the things that Shannon wrote about in the '40s was that you don't want to be you want to be looking at the board when it's nice and quiet for the most part. Um, if you're if you're like your king is in check or if you're doing these massive peace exchanges and your ply stops right here, there's this horizon beyond which you cannot see. And right. something drastic might have happened. So if there's a lot of action on the board, you need to just keep going down and down that tree to figure out how did that resolve that particular little bit of drama. And this game will do that as well. Um, another thing that's cool that you had to do was... Um, you might have more time, so you um, you want to explore more if you have more time, but you might have less time. Um, there's, hold on. Uh, this game, this game has an amazing yeah, AI yeah. in it. Yeah, and, and what you can do when you want to stop the computer from thinking, you just press the fire button and the computer has to stop where they are and use its best move it's found to that point. So it needs to be looking in not depth first. You need to be doing a lot of breadth first yeah. kind of stuff yeah. in this tree yeah. before for going depth first. So um, you really had to do some some serious thinking. And you couldn't just, I mean, this chess game can't just make a bunch of copies of the board. It starts saying, okay, I'm going to make this virtual stack. I'm going to say my piece went here and it captured this piece and it's followed by this piece and this. And it has to wind all of this to get the board back to where it was because you're still playing a game, right? And you have very limited resources to work right. in. So 
huge respect for the people that are able to do that. Again, Python script is just cheating. You just take the concepts no, you're, and you waste just brute forcing, brute forcing. No optimization took place at all. Yeah. So the, let's see where we're at this video. We have look ahead of eight now. And so, okay, we're doing good on that. Um, one of the at very what moment in time, at what moment in time can you clearly start seeing like, okay, my look ahead is at a level now where it becomes really hard for level four of the C64 game to keep up with me. I'm starting to. Now, we can see that right now. The board evaluation is two. That means uh, if you if you look at it right now, it says board evaluation. Yeah, that means yeah. it's up two points. And I and now I'm increasing the look ahead to nine. Yeah, so yeah. I I give one point for each pirate, and I give one point for each hold that is not yet blown. Right. And of course, I subtract that when when taken away from you know from the opponent. Um, and now the board evaluation is three. It thinks it's three ahead. So it is clearly winning. It has a lead. It's keeping its lead. It can see nine moves ahead. There's going to come a point in here where that board evaluation is not going to be three. It's going to be 10,000. All of a sudden, it goes up to that high number. That means I see the win. I know the future. And in 12 moves or fewer, I am absolutely guaranteed to win. The Commodore, right. of course, can't see that until it is within four moves. And I'll, I'll show that um, difference when that comes. Before that, though, there weren't a whole lot of resources to, unless you were like subscribed to computer journals or went to the library to figure this stuff out in the early 80s, right? Or the late 70s. Sure. Uh, this is one of the very few books that was out there. This is um, Computer Gamemanship. Uh, this is by Levy. This is 1983. And it doesn't contain code per se, but it talks at a high level of Minimax and Alpha Beta pruning. It has various static evaluation functions for a whole bunch of different right. games on here, right. a probabilistic reasoning. Um, there's tons of copies out there. They're cheap. This is like a $5 book. This is not like when Robin describes something and the price goes up. You're going to easily find a copy of this. Yeah. Not a lot of people know about it. So that, that's a good one to add to your um, collection. Um, let's see, where are we at? Look, board evaluation still three. So there's a guy named Oscar Toledo uh, Guterres who has been making modern advances in um, all of this kind of constrained AI. And he wrote a 1K6502 chess program called Atom Chess that yeah. I think is pretty impressive as graphic sound, a joystick input. I'll put a link to that in the forums. But he's also written the Nano Chess, which is really quite a good um, chess AI. Yeah. Uh, and this yeah. is a complete book, which is just describing line by line how the thing works because <laughs> he's... Yeah. Um, I, I have, it's it's just that block of text right there. That's it. It's JavaScript. And it yeah. it does everything. It does pawn promotion on passant. Um, it does castling. Um, it's all in so very few characters. But um, it's, it's, it's impressive. He puts a lot of thought into how these things. So there, it's nice that somebody is taking these constrained things and moving them ahead. Okay. We're now on to Python look ahead 12. This is as far as I drove it, but I could probably drive it farther. Okay, I accidentally launched the wrong pirate, but there's only two more pirates left to launch. And so on the very so next turn... There for a sec so pause there for a second there, when you said I accidentally launched it, but that was just a typo, right? Eh? Just a fat Yeah, I so entered it wrong. There was two pirates left to launch. I launched yeah. the wrong one by mistake, and yeah. I was like, dang, I'm going to have to start this video all over. But then mm. Python on its very next turn asked for the other pirate to be launched. And so then the game board was back in sync again, in which same Right, thing. right, 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 right. Um, but Which is so, so it basically was able to correct for the mistake in the in the typo pretty quickly. Well, I have an undo function I put into this in case I made a typo, but I don't have an undo on the Commodore side. <laughs> right. right, right, right. So now so, on the Commodore side, uh, let's pause for a second on the Commodore yeah. side. The way the game was set up, um, would the game uh, start making taking more time to think out its moves, or uh, or was it time bound, or what? what it behaves what? exactly like my Python. When there's a ton of things to consider, it's slow, and when it's getting close to the end, it's fast because there's right. just it's it's doing the. So it will start speeding is, up then because it yeah. sees a reduced number of moves it can possibly make. Still, well, look at this. I'm at twelve ply, and I only evaluated seventeen thousand positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the pruning. Yeah, so dramatically okay. dramatically dropping uh dropping now yeah this is why ais are deadly in the end game like chess end games you never beat a chess program in the end game you beat it yeah. in the middle um yeah. so but this is where it gets kind of interesting so watch this um 
the score, the evaluation is about to hop up here. And um, I'm going to pause this. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Goes from so seven. the evaluation is now 10,000. It's look ahead is looking 12 moves down the ply. It now sees that it is one. It is inevitable. It's yeah. perhaps not easy to see from, from the board, but Python knows that it is totally one. And you're going to see the point at which the Commodore knows it wins when it's only four moves ahead. So um, we'll let that play for a little bit. Um, yeah, in college, I wrote a Gomaku program, which is just get five in a row. And mm -hmm. all I did was a static evaluation function on that. I didn't have any look ahead at all, and the thing would still beat me occasionally because for if you just want to get five stones in a row, for every stone, I would just exert influence out in a horizontal, vertical, and diagonal directions, like one point. And so when you had a bunch of stones on there, that would that would aggregate up. And so it was catching me in two and three way traps with no smarts whatsoever. It's just the one board evaluation wow. function that did wow. everything. Um, I'm now turning off the warp mode because I know I'm in the end game. I don't want to watch him walk the plank. I don't want him to walk in fast motion. I want to celebrate. Uh, that's why I took it out of warp mode. And okay, so pretty soon, let's see. I think this is the spot where um, he knows he's dead. Um, Oh no! Yeah, after I after I plow through some of these, hey, uh, you're, you're maxed out at the ten thousand uh, for the board. Oh yeah, you can't go any higher. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. So it says C64 now sees that it loses in four moves and walks a plank. That purple yeah. pirate, if that purple yeah. pirate went diagonally up, then green would launch a cannon pirate onto it and kill it. Right. If that purple pirate went diagonally down, green would launch a pirate from the cannon and kill it. These are the pirates that wrapped around when they went. I talked about four. Right. If the pirate goes straight, because it has to do some move, yeah, then green will waste a move and stall by taking that top left-hand pirate and moving it forward. Yeah, And then he's forced to go into the hatch and blow it, at which point this green pirate will go in and kill it. That's exactly yeah. four moves away. It's a four-ply game, and it sees it, and it now knows that it has lost. If it was yeah. played on an e easier skill level, it wouldn't know at this time that it had lost. Right, right, right. And so the commander sees this, he walks the plank, yeah, walks and the that's plank. the end of the game. And so the that's game. how I know what the ply, how the ply lines up with the, the difficulty level. Right. So um, anyway. This that's... is awesome. Now, now having having looked at this, uh, I, I think you said, you said you hadn't spoken to anybody yet that had... Uh, at one this at level four some people even uh, were able to master it at level three or do yeah. their own saying indeed yeah I, I read a couple of people saying they could beat it at level three yeah, yeah. Um, pretty pretty I, impressive this is uh, there's there's few data points to draw from these are just posts i see online from people that are better sure. me at playing it yeah sure so i so how does this compare because you've done a couple of these games now and the approach that you take on this is you can repeat eh? like you said chess uh, would be another great candidate to uh uh, to uh, try this on an eight yeah. two. How, how does this? How does this one compare? Kind of like without having looked much at the code. What what can you kind of tell about the game and and the implementation of Minimax? Uh, I I think it's it. Minimax generalizes marvelously. Um, this old approach is great for classic games where there's not very many states on the board. Where it's poor is when the number of states is huge. So for instance, there's a, the, the the game Go. Uh, mm -hmm. doesn't really work well with just a pure mini max it's it's absolutely terrible because there's just far too many moves to consider right. um and it's hard to make a heuristic function and know what to do um go of course um in recent years has become dominated by um conventional machine learning you know the neural net stuff um yeah. uh, alpha go you know uh beat lisa doll um yeah. Four, yeah. four out of five games. And the fact that he won one at all was absolutely amazing. I lost a bet at work on that <laughs> right. when that was yeah. happening. Um, the modern ones, though, they will, and I haven't done any of this programming at all. So I'm just talking from stuff I've read. They use, um, I don't know if you've heard of Monte Carlo kinds of stuff that's used to, to you know, discover distributions and stuff. It came out of the physics world, but you can um, you can do a Monte Carlo search tree. So you start your, your trees of these branches. But once you get to the bottom, you don't use a static evaluation function anymore. You let the game play at random until you see what person won, which side won. Yeah. 
And yeah. then you do this in a bunch of different ways, way down in these leaves, and then you bubble up those winds and lose to see what the wind mass right. is. Right. And the cool thing about this approach, it's usually used in combination with other approaches, is that you now don't have to write a static evaluation function at all, which means you don't have to know how to play the game well. All you need to know how to do is make a mini max tree and then play it random. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's great when you have no now you're not going to be the 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 big kid on the block if you don't know how to play the game well, but it's very paralyzable. Paral parallelizable, parallelizable. I, I said six yeah. syllables, it's five syllables. Um yeah. because you can be exploring all these random games at the same time. Uh like right. I said, I've never tried it, but um that's pretty cool. Um that's um we use Monte Carlo stuff at work, of course, all the time, but I, I doubt Visa for that. Uh, tangent, though, um, for my work, uh, we had a bunch of Cray supercomputers there uh, all the way up into the late 90s. Uh, they're now in the Computer um, History Museum. History Museum, yeah, in Montevideo, yeah. 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 They, they, went yeah. To, they went to a Berkeley National Lab, and they went to me. They had a little bit of a, a route to get there. But um, we have a had a mathematician there named Harry Nelson, and he wrote some really tight assembly code on the Cray's and won the computer chess competition, the world computer chess competition for a couple times uh, in the 80s. And um, uh, about a decade ago, he invited me to a couple of puzzle parties. These are um, private party meetups. Uh, Donald Knuth was there, who, by the way, also helped with Minimax trees in the 70s. And I went to his house and there was this, I think I've told you the story before, there was a fast load cartridge on the wall from Epix in a frame. I was like, why is there a fast load cartridge on your wall? And it turns out his son, Scott Nelson, had created all of that. And Scott happened to be there that day. And he gave me a detailed explanation of how it all worked, which I don't remember. I'd probably understand more about that today. So I just, I got the news at the wrong time. I'm, I'm more into Commodore now, but um, yeah, that, was, yeah. that was pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, so the game here, the game at four levels, how does it, how does it compare? Just, just, you know, you've done a couple. How does it compare? How does it, how, how intelligent is it compared to, for instance, the chess game that you had previously? Oh, oh, this is a very simple game compared to chess. Um, this, what makes this kind of hard is that all the pieces move in lockstep. So that's yeah. kind of hard for me to reason about, but that's really easy for a computer to reason about. It's like, um, certain kinds of Rubik's cube kinds of puzzles, those permutation puzzles. There's yeah. a number of them, like some, um, you know, the two by two by two or the tetrahedral yeah. one, things like this, that are never more people have proven. They're never more than 11 moves away from solution. But yeah. no human can take that approach really, or a few humans can. Few humans see that it's 11 moves right. away because right. they need some, they need to hold certain things in place as they adjust other things and do stuff like that. But the but the that Cayley graph, right? That diameter yeah. is is really narrow, and that that's the same thing for this. There's not a lot of different things to look at. It's just weird for a human. I mean, somebody pirate themed this this abstract game because screen wrap on ropes and going around with the cannons and cannons right. launching pirates right. and stuff. It's not really. I know it's a better game because it's pirate themed, but it was clearly an abstract game that somebody made on some graph paper with some pennies or something like that right. before right. 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 before it ever became pirates. Um, Level four, could I beat it in time? I don't know, maybe. Um, um, I'm going to be more interested when the, when the when the cell phone version comes out to uh, try to make an AI to take that on, I think, would be more. <laughs> but, well, um, but, the, but you know, the chances of, with that one is that the look I have is going to be many times greater than the four. Well, I would need to have a static evaluation function that was better than just right. count the right. number of pirates, right? Because I, all I did was scale dumb and, and, and right. it worked. Right. So, so, so yeah. and, and to that point then, to that point, now you you won with a look ahead of 12 did you experiment at all with other look ahead values oh i could have gone farther than that um and i'm How happy well reduced? Let, um what's that oh so when i was reducing i i need to do some more experiments i was losing when my ply was close to the commodore supply which made me think its function was better but i think i had a bug in the alpha beta pruning at that time as well so i might be conflating those two things i don't know um okay. But it's a great game. It is definitely very challenging. It it can be one or two players. Um, if it's two players, the thing you got to know is that player two uses joystick one, player one uses yeah. joystick two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you so so the, other, the other thing, I, and that's actually, it's a fun game. Eh? It's got a lot of replay value when it comes to this. Now, you spoke briefly about some of this code being available. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. Well, um, my code, my my. Um, my Python script I have it on GitHub. It's going to be a link in the CRX uh, forums that go with this video. So I will okay. make that and, available. And, you know, I, uh, for people that haven't seen that, uh, you're typically very good at documenting things. Uh, 
Um, I, I see a lot of this as, as, as great learning material for a student that's entering in AI, the basic concepts, and do it in a real fun way as well. And play yeah, with depending your, on your, depending on your college, this is a this is depending on the college, this is sophomore or junior level um, coding. I think I, I, right, I didn't. Right. And just, if you're a I'm bit just, older, like uh, people like me, then you know it may take a few evenings extra, and that's totally fine. But I I, I do I, what I really do like is the way you approach this, and and kind of made it available for people to kind of understand this in a, in a live concept. I really do think that, if, that a lot of people will appreciate that. If you want to look at the history, this has been studied, like I've said, since the 1920s. This is an excellent book, uh, the collected papers of uh, Claude Shannon. So lots of his chess things in here. And you got to remember, these guys were were writing up how to do all this before the computer was available to try it on. They were anxious for um, that right. hardware to come along. So um, it's actually interesting. Eh? So, you know, you know, you've know, you shown three titles uh, here so far. Eh? Uh, and I know yeah, well, I know. Course. <laughs> one of one of them you're particularly fond of indeed, and you should bring it back in at some point in time uh, again to plug it because I I do believe that that one uh, that oh, one is this, a real um, Toledo Nano Chess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this guy is great. Um, he has written what I think is the best Atari Twenty Six Hundred programming game book. It came out just this last year. I've read a, a number of them. It's all assembly language, right? Six five zero two. But he goes deep and he has tons of examples and gradually builds it up. And you have full breakout games and all kinds of stuff. He's also really into constrained games. He's he writes he's has two volumes on boot sector games. Remember the boot sector yeah, viruses yeah, for a long yeah, time ago? Yeah. Well, we don't make viruses and boot sectors anymore, but he recreates those old boot sectors and tries to make the most compelling game you possibly can in just the size of a boot sector. And he's written two books on that too. Um he's got books well, on the think Yeah, and I think I think it's really interesting. And while while CRX is mostly a Commodore event. I think a lot of the great books, the great books that are available for the Commodore are very, very well known. What I really like is you kind of looked at it from another angle as well. Let's let's take a look at the 6502 and kind of see what else great stuff has been written here. And this is this is a fantastic example here of of an even more constrained environment. And some of the magic uh, that that was pulled off there. So I I'm think I'm very partial to 6502. I don't I don't think I have the, the brain power to learn a bunch of different assembly languages i mean people like burger that know and can write natively in every architecture out there those people really impress me but but 6502 is fun it's recreational thinking so so oh, i i think you know people people definitely should start watching your 64 second explanations for those that are like uh, hyper uh, shiny object syndrome well, let's try and test that out with your 64 seconds, eh? because you, unfortunately, you've not been taking on the simplest games either. It's all games that, you know, 64 minutes would have been a better fit if it was up to me. But uh, 64 seconds to at least, you know, tease you enough. So, OK, it's worth uh, looking at. I think this is the first time where you said, hey, I've, I've played this game, but now it's worthy of of a lot more background, actually. To, to kind of look behind the scenes here and kind of place it within the context of today with AI being all the hype, where really what we've been talking about so far is stuff that goes all the way back to the 20s, I think, the first uh, yeah. concepts were there. Well, I told my coworkers I was doing some AI because I work with a lot of AI folks and they're like, Rip. I told them and they all laughed. So. Yeah, yeah. the 64 seconds, I've only made a dozen of those. I've had two guest speakers. I had Amy Taylor do one. I had Glenn Case do one. So if anybody's watching this and has a favorite game and think they can explain in 64 seconds, I'd love to have you as a guest speaker. Just let me know. That's fantastic. Yeah, those, those are really good. I don't, I don't have too many other talking points on this. Uh, I look forward to see what anybody wants to do with the code and improve it. Um, remember, I just stopped as soon as it beat the Commodore. So. Right, right. Well, and I, I, I think given given the nature of the games that you've been evaluating as part of 64 seconds, a lot of this code is going to be reusable. Right? The concepts are being used in quite a few different uh, games of, of of that era, and even today still. Uh, so we may see some reuse of the code coming in uh, here or there uh, in in order to be able to beat yeah. the game. These are all very well te known techniques, but it's um, if you've never played with them before, they're fascinating and they're fun, and everybody should make at least one sometime so hey now uh you know it always uh it, it's almost uh, become a running gag uh, between uh, you and i do you want to do a last uh last closing plug for your favorite game favorite game oh archon so archon has good ai as well 
um, not just the combat, but it makes good moves and understands board positions and understands the light and the dark and understands when to cast certain kinds of spells. I don't know how the AI works in that. I would love to see if somebody um, has reversed that and uh, document how that all works. I'm sure somebody has. I just haven't Google searched for it yet. But um, yeah, Yuri and I have this um, friendly debate about Archon. He just, um, that was not part of his Commodore experience growing up and he thinks it's overhyped and overrated. So uh, anyway. <laughs> It's fantastic. Okay. I I've met many fanboys of the uh, of the Archon game since though, so it, it it turns out you're not the only person on the planet that loves the game. Yeah, it's it's a marvelous game. So so hey, uh, piracy, great game. Yeah. Uh, I I think I think uh, what you've uh, shown here today uh, was uh, not just highly entertaining, but we, I actually think most people will have learned a little bit as well. Thank you for making it open source as well. Everybody should do that for this type of stuff. This is cool to bring into, especially if you're a bit younger, you're still in college, go and bring it in there. Bring some fun back to college. Bring Commodore 64 <laughs> to the college floor. Go and do it. This is, this is awesome stuff. David, thanks so much for your time, man. Thank you. See you in the next one. Bye for now.